Thanks for inviting me. It's nice to come and uh, share some uh, current thinking that I'm working through. So I'm very open, of course, to uh, share in some conversation afterwards. So for today, I want to draw attention, we could say, to the ways in which sounds work to destabilize the fixity of form, opening up to experiences of fragmentation and disturbance, as well as, I would say, modes of celebration and togetherness. From the ephemeral currents of surrounding voices to the noise of this other one, it seems we might draw from sound a particular knowledge, the knowledge of the permeable, the emergent, the interrupted, what Letitia Sabse highlights as a framework through which to turn vulnerability into a position of engagement, sharing, a being with and for each other. She writes, to be permeable, this body that is open to others. We might additionally find this in the literary work of Monique Fatigue, and in particular her book, The Lesbian Body, where we are presented with a body and a writing overcome with permeability. She writes, you turn me inside out. I am a glove in your hands, gently, firmly, inexorably holding my throat in your palm. I struggle, I am frantic, I enjoy fear. You count the veins and the arteries, you retract them to one side. You reach the vital organs, you breathe into my lungs through my mouth. I stifle, you hold the long tubes of the viscera, you unfold them you uncoil them, you slide them around your neck. I cannot speak, your teeth biting my cheeks, your lips unscathed at the edge of my lips." End quote. Fatigue leads us into the unworking of borders, territories, of language and identities, a rending and a sharing of singularity through the erotic joys and intensities of a radical consensuality, a coming together that we might say both interrupts and supports the articulation of a feminist self. This interruption that reconfigures oneself as never only one. As it laughs, licks, digests, extends, is captured and gives the generosity of this arm, a leg, around and through, and that remakes the world by occupying the between, by giving way to how things pass through the border of the skin, this skin always touched and broken by another. Permeability is therefore put forward as what may assist in reconstituting a self as more than itself, giving way to an ethics of radical openness and which we may lead to new states of togetherness, maybe the first togetherness truly had or made, the beginning of ecstasy, what we should call togethering, togethering, in this sense, I want to move us toward this process or figuring of togethering as an ethics poised around interruption and rebellion. For fatigue, we could say the lesbian body is a type of weapon, a freedom fighter, and that forces into the field of meaning a body of thresholds, leaks, generosities the body as a gift given along the edges of itself as a vitality, a heat, a breath passing from this lung to another's. While fatigue captures this sheer physicality and depth of togethering, 
as skin against skin and deeper, a type of composition of viscera, I want to move toward sound and listening as the basis for an equally permeable event, as well as knowledge path. This sound that interrupts singularity to draw one into an arena of conflict, contact, shared space, the realm of the intersubject or the interacoustic. Is not sound a type of passage from one to another, a tactile, vibratory intensity that comes from a distance to prick the skin, making it bleed with a certain voluptuous pain, the pain of the arrival of the other, which is also a joy and which we may name the joy of community. Sound never leaves us as a figure alone. It does not sit still, nor does it respect the border of a singularity. Sound itself is the very basis for assemblages and composites, intersections and overlaps. It is always picking up and weaving together so many impressions and surfaces as it goes. Voices and rhythms giving us an echo of ourselves as a body not solely our own. Me to you, you to this, this to that, that to those there and further around this corner and back again or upward thrown into the shadowy depths and up, up through the throat and down into the gut this assemblage of touched bodies and things. I hear myself hearing myself. I am thrown into the world by these sounds as they exit the mouth, the hand, the breath, these respirations of the vital body that we may hear as a passage from one to another, as the basis for ecstasy sound as the echo of oneself outside oneself, always coming back as another. You, me, like a ricochet or a hinge, to be hinged and unhinged, rehinged. I am unworked by the listening that you make me suffer, suffering with pleasure. What I'm tracing or maybe drawing here is less a subject of self-containment and even self-determination, and more a type of weakness, a dissolution, one that I want to pose as a productive event or position, a knowledge of the permeable, the emergent, and the interrupted that composes forms of togetherness, that togethers us, this us body, this lesbian community, this listening ecstasy. While sound and listening may work to deepen relations with others, it does so in such a way that exposes oneself, that tears me apart. It is not a display, but an exposition. It literally opens me up, drawing me out. It carries me forward and it leaves me behind this interacoustic, while driving others into me, these others that take up residence in the folds of this body. Therefore, we must ask, how can I remain myself as I listen? Am I not always already displaced, unworked, and reconstructed according to hearing? Am I not persecuted by sound? by the listening imposed onto me by another. I would ask you to consider how in this moment I am inhabited by your listening. Your listening presses me, presses this voice out of me and I into you. Is this not the expression of a community of ecstasy? The sonic framework I'm working through here 
locates us then within the tossing and turning of the ephemeral and the flow of life with others as that which is always already tensed by discontinuity, pain, community, according to the tenuous and conflicted pressures shaped by hearing, and further by the inherent ambiguity of sound, which Paul Carter highlights as an explicitly erotic potential. The erotic as the becoming of meaning, the overflow, or the excitations of encounter that can never be fully held by representation or by the semantic, that always grips the body. From such conditions and experiences, I might suggest that a certain reconfiguration of form and meaning of this body and those surrounding it may be found one nurtured by the dirty acoustics of being together. I'm interested in how sound then reconfigures the subject, less as self-determining and more as never alone to begin with, an interrupted subject, always already exposed by and for others. From such a state, I am never myself to give, wholly and fully. Rather, one is figured by a network of relations, of penetrations and permeability, of interruption and fragmentation, in which participation is more a state of commotion and contagion. As Judith Butler outlines, the performativity of the subject is predicated on a structure of power and discourse that precedes appearance, that gives to me a name through which I search for the means to inhabit the social arena of meaning. In other words, the subject is determined by an exteriority, a social order that enables one to appear, to enter while regulating one's entrance according to systems of meaning. I am brought into language through a repetition to speak the words properly. I move my mouth as others do, as language is placed into this mouth, shaping its structure, its movements, its voicing. In this way, I am called into being by this social order and as such, I am continually held by constructs of power and what they may allow as well as foreclose. From the call into being and the languages that are put into the mouth to the echo I then perform, subjectivity is fundamentally vulnerable to an exteriority, is in fact constituted, even contaminated, by this relationality. To be a subject then is to seek out the possibilities and the means of reworking the rhythms and the significations of this name I am given. In this regard, I am never fully in possession of myself as a subject. Rather, I must answer back to this call as an echo that beats back its demands, or that searches for ways to rework meaning. I can only speak insofar as particular conditions enable it. The conditions laid out here by others, for instance, and by a discourse that asks of me to perform, that moves me into speech, that breaks me down. Such relational intensities, such performativity can be seen as a bond that makes us vulnerable to and for each other. In other words, the interrupted subject is in fact the beginning of a certain precariousness, reminding us of our dependency on others, of our deep bond with an exteriority through which I exist 
and am sustained. This bond to an exteriority, this interrupted state that defers myself from ever arriving at myself, of ever taking possession of myself fully, is ultimately captured in what Jean-Luc Nancy terms community. For Nancy, it becomes imperative to shift the idea of subjectivity as self-contained and self-determined and toward being always already more than one, a being singular plural. As such, Nancy, in fact, leaves subjectivity behind, emphasizing instead a notion of singularity. This singularity that is less a container of interiority, of self-consciousness, and more as an exposure to others, a finitude, a limit, a self less a self-sufficient master and more a state of assemblage, in other words, community. Finally, he then characterizes community not as a form of work, but of passion and ecstasy, the sharing of singularity. Community, in other words, not as a project, but as the unworking of being, what he calls ultimately the inoperative. From such a framework, self and community emerge as fundamentally linked, which ultimately unsettles subjectivity, interrupts it. This I that is always already fragmented and linked to others. Returning to Monique Fatigue, the I is never only one, but is always already interrupted, linked. In her writing, she puts the I in italics, making of it a movement, here slanted, as if leaning toward another or pushed by what precedes it. And further, in her writing, the word my is broken, written with a slash between the M and the Y, thereby cutting it in two, as if one never fully owns or possesses what it claims for itself. My arm is not only mine, thereby cutting it into two. Instead, possession is staggered, interrupted by the perennial intrusion and complementarity of an exterior, by the force of a community. The lesbian community that interrupts language with an intensification of the erotic, that rebels against structures of ownership and possession with radical sharing. Ecstasy is therefore staged as the condition of and for community, as the sharing of singularities, which breaks me apart as an inoperative unworking of being, and which we might begin to hear as the spread and diffusion of a certain cacophony or vibration, a noise, commotion, contagion. How might we think sound and listening in relation to questions of subjectivity and community? In what ways does the performativity of the subject include or incite a sonic question? an unsteady relation to hearing as well as naming. Might we in fact find in sonic discourses a model for how to intensify the interrupted subject as the basis for nurturing bonds with others, especially through and because of the passion and the suffering of being permeable? I'm interested to reflect upon sound and listening then as the basis for rethinking the project of agency, of self-determination, and the possessing and claiming of one's body, and how one might find support structures for states of struggle through conditions of permeability. Does sound and listening enable the formation of particular practices 
that explicitly unwork the limits of the body? And if so, might such practices suggest a specific knowledge of the permeable and the potentially linked? In other words, if sound moves me out of myself and into others, and others into myself, what other types of movement might it support or suggest? Following this line of thinking, I want to propose that sound may act as a path for the expression of passion and ecstasy, that as a vibratory and echoing matter, sound dramatically threads in and out of bodies, traversing spaces and borders to align and link, to interrupt and fragment. Maybe a type of rhythming found in the call and response of community, in the beats that beat back against and for another. As such, sound touches a deep nerve, the nerve and the cell of this materiality to shiver us with the pleasure of suffering, of being broken apart by this other, the togethering whose rhythms give way to a co-motion. In his lectures on the topic of living together, Roland Barthes considers what he terms small social formations. The assembly not of mass demonstrations or urban strikes, nor even of societies or states, but rather groupings of individuals. Taken from cultures of monastic life and their communal orientation, he poses the term idiorhythmy as a way to probe the relation between an individual and a community. Idiorhythmy captures how personal rhythms inflect or rub against a larger order of living together, tensing this order with its syncopations, its elations, and its depressions. In short, Bart draws upon idiorhythmy to imagine models for being alone and being a part of life with others at the same time. In her preface to the related publication, Kate Briggs emphasizes how idiorhythmy names any attempt to reconcile collective life with individual life, the independence of the subject with the sociability of the group. There exists then an agonistic tension where one aligns or discords with existing rhythms, detouring durations, following in line only to veer off. Idiorhythmy is a type of pulse held between the bios of this body and the order of a social limit, and whose beat registers this relation as a performative. As such, it grants room or flexibility to the regimentation of social ordering, to society as a group formation. Idiorhythmy cuts against the project of identification as a dominant timing, giving life instead to the stringent capture of productive behavior, figuring improvisations, lapses, intervals. In short, an erotic interplay that gives way to drift and pleasure, and the wandering of interrhythms, even a disrhythming of societal structures of the order of things. As Bart suggests, quote, before anything else, the first thing that power imposes is a rhythm to everything, a rhythm of life, of time, of thought, of speech. The demand for idiorhythmy is always made in opposition to power. Idiorhythmy therefore describes a formation of living together which is tensed with gaps and intervals, excitations and withdrawals, conflict, ultimately defining what he calls a flexible, free, mobile rhythm, a transitory, fleeting form, but a form nonetheless. A transitory, fleeting form, but a form nonetheless. In this sense, idiorhythmy is a type of commotion, commotion 
as composition, one that communicates a disturbance, a noise that nonetheless organizes or is organizationally attuned, setting into motion a form, the form of fragmentation, of getting carried away, away and together at the same time, ecstatic. Commotion generates alignments and alliances between oneself and others to produce a type of crowd, yet one that is also an interference, a breakbeat, a dropped note. As such, the idiorhythmy of commotion, of being in the throng, alone in the crowd, an anarchic body, might be said to function as a framework through which one begins to learn how to live with others, not as an expression of social cohesion or identification, but rather as a community in movement, not as a project, but as a passion. While commotion works to set us in motion, a movement of joining together, a type of togethering, as something inherently unstable, agonistic, ecstatic, contagion infects such movements, charging them with the potentiality of contamination, dissemination. Commotion requires or presupposes infection, the spreading of something, a noise that trembles the constitution of the body. I am intruded upon by something, a vibration, an ambient agent. I reach down to turn up the volume, this contagion, because it sounds too good. It hits the body to shiver the nerves, returning myself as another, fixed and unfixed, by the excitations of a type of sonic metabolism. These sounds that thread me into their vitality, a world of agitation that rhythms me. I would say then I am dispossessed of myself, driven out by this infection. And what such dispossession allows or demands is the figuring of a certain kind of ethics, an ethics of radical openness. Dispossession performs to bring into relief the ways in which bodies are fundamentally vulnerable and reliant upon conditions of support. It brings us to the limits of ourselves and from which we must seek through the agency and caring of others the possibility of survival. Not only to be heard, but also to share in the hearing of oneself, in the voice and vocalizations by which others join in the commotion, the compassion, and the consensuality hearing produces. I am unworked by this noise. I am inhabited by it, taken over. It spreads me around. I share it, it shares me. This dispossession that inaugurates community. Here we might say that sound allows one to participate in the unworking of oneself and in the passions of togethering. That if it supplies a particular framework for action, it is in the act of community. As such, a kind of sonic community is the articulation of a movement of ecstasy the ecstasy of being more than one, the articulation of a commotion and a compassion, a conjoining that is always already fragment, an excess and a rapture. This might be its potentiality and its pleasure to continually unwork itself, to be infected by others. These two conditions of commotion and contagion might be in a way models or capacities of the interrupted subject, of being an interrupted subject, plying us into formations with others of shared movements and infectious passions. 
As such, they suggest a view onto participation less as a willful act, a conscious decision, a reasonable thought. Rather, instead, one is drawn into an arena of commotion, infected by the performativity of a community, sound as a contagion through which participation is viral, erotic. So, finally, I'm attempting in a way, I could say, to capture the ways in which we might understand the formation, or better, the deformation of subjectivity according to the conditions and events of sound and listening. The state of being permeable, instigated by sound, is one of exposure, of being broken open, opening toward others, of being one within and through many. As such, permeability figures one less as stable and secure, finding the skills and leading to a certain tendency to fragmentation, rupture, linking, the skills of being together. From such conditions, one learns of the contingent and the ephemeral, the joy and the agony of sharing. And further, in a way, how to practice community, which must be highlighted as the basis for dispersal and generosity, a dispossession, a giving away that undermines the mechanisms of accumulation, ownership, and the possessiveness of the male horde. From the inoperative community of the permeable and the passionate to the idiorhythms of transient formations, what sound may suggest is a type of paradigm, the paradigm of the incomplete. The body that is never in possession of itself, solely and fully, and as such enables not a being with others, but rather a being in and through others. All of which only further emphasizes the generative and rebellious potentiality found in what it means to be touched and to give sound. And which finally Monique Batigue once again gives narrative. As she writes, my fingers sink into the orifices in your back, your loins. Your fingers are inserted into the holes in my neck, my cranium. In the end, a tempest arrives. It rushes right through us, scattering the muscles. First, I hear your cries. Then I hear myself cry out, as you do. There is a bellowing of sirens. They reverberate within the gaping tunnels on either side of our two bodies, which constitute a single organism, pervaded by vibrations, quivering full of its currents. Is it not so, my dearest? Thank you. <laughs>